Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, fellow scientists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a pleasure to address the Global Landscape Forum in Bonn, just as the GLF series enters into a new phase of influence and impact. I commend in particular the determination of the GLF to build on the broad engagement of and contributions by many organizations and its values that prioritize collective action. As an organic chemist, biodiversity scientist, and president of a small island developing state, the GLF's mission is close to my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, as well all know, the world's diverse but vitally important landscapes are under stress. The threats to biodiversity are grave, more so in Africa, than anywhere else. African species are disappearing at almost twice the global rate, driven inexorably by habitat loss, the introduction of non-invasive species, and humanity's ever-expanding footprint. According to the United Nations Environmental Programme report on the state of biodiversity in Africa, the biodiversity of our continent continues to decline with ongoing loss of species and habitats across every one of our 54 nations. This has been caused directly and indirectly by human actions, which include extraction, deforestation, poaching, and harmful, harmful processes such as slash and burn agriculture. Particularly threatened are Africa's freshwater ecosystems. To make matters more urgent, the effects of all these pressures are being further amplified by climate change. Civil societies have long recognized the imperative of slowing biodiversity loss on the African continent. To this end, the Convention on Biological Diversity held in Japan in 2010 ratified the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011 to 2020. The plan consists of a mission, vision, goals, and specific targets for protecting biodiversity in Africa, collectively known as the HE Biodiversity Targets. Progress in achieving the HE targets in Africa is mixed. A periodic status report, the Global Biodiversity Outlook, tells us that Africa lags behind the rest of the world in terms of improving knowledge and dedicating financial, institutional, and technical resources to more forcefully address and mitigate the decline in biodiversity. Africa, ladies and gentlemen, also lacks appropriate and harmonized biodiversity indicators to assess conservation needs and progress against goals and suffer from data and information deficiencies. The dearth of rapid or readily available information on Africa biodiversity presents a barrier to accurately assessing the status, trends, threats, and conservation needs for biodiversity in Africa. But there are some encouraging indicators. Over 80% of countries in Africa show progress on updating national biodiversity strategies and action plans, facilitating their implementations and use as policy instruments. The continent has promoted the mainstreaming and understanding of the values of biodiversity, designating protected areas, ratifying an international protocol on access and benefit sharing, updating national action plans, and respecting the traditional knowledge and values of indigenous peoples. The role of women in traditional cultures in maintaining its biodiversity cannot be overstated. UNEP recognizes that for many women, biodiversity is a cornerstone of their work, their belief systems, and their basic survival. For indigenous and local communities in particular, direct links with the land are fundamental, and obligations to maintain these links form the core of individual and group identity. These relationships extend far back into human history, when divisions of responsibilities by gender began. Scientists have discovered that 
as early as the early Stone Age, women's role and task in hunter-gatherer communities were explicitly linked to biodiversity with the natural environment, in essence, determining the status and well-being. And UNEP also finds natural quote, in many regions, up to 90% of the planting materials of the poorest farming communities may be derived from the seeds and germplasm from the communities produce, select, and save themselves. Women farmers have been largely responsible for the improvement and adaptation of many plant varieties, fulfilling nurturing and stewardship roles." Unquote. As we modernize, we must support traditional knowledge systems, such as those related to sustainable agriculture. Among the features of this preservation are enlightened agriculture and trade policies, intellectual property rights on the conservation and sustainable use of biological resources, the empowerment of women as stewards of these ecosystems, and the equitable sharing of benefits. In this regard, ladies and gentlemen, the examples and lessons of experience of Mauritius, a small African country, may be illustrative. Mauritius is a nation of just 1.3 million inhabitants that lies 680 miles to the southeast coast of the African continent. The Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund recognizes it as one of the five global biodiversity hotspots, along with our island neighbors in the Western Indian Ocean. Together, we are home to an astounding total weight of plant, a total of eight plant families, four bird families, and five primate families that are found nowhere else on Earth. In thinking of the relationship between climate change and loss of biodiversity, it is illustrative to think of the co-relationship of diabetes to coronary artery disease, comorbidity. Each condition in multivariate are an interdependent. It is therefore difficult to address biodiversity loss without addressing climate change. As all of you are aware, the management of climate change, like the sustainable management of biodiversity, represents a complex interdependence of many factors, touching upon aspects of the environment, culture, and the economy. Economic modeling of the impact of climate change on Africa predicts a mean average global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2040, with cost equivalent to 1.7% of Africa's GDP. And as the mean temperature rises to 2.2 degrees centigrade by 2060, economic costs increase to the equivalent of 3.4%. And by the end of the century, with a mean temperature rise of 4.1 degrees centigrade, the economic costs are predicted to be equivalent to just under 10% of the continent's GDP. Ladies and gentlemen, the oceanscapes that cover the globe and surround Mauritius provide a framework for how the pressures of financial well-being and culture impact a major source of food and energy that serves as an incubator for biodiversity. Oceans are home to about two million species, from the largest animal that have ever lived to the tiniest bacterium. Marine biodiversity far outweighs that on land. Oceans cover 71% of our planet's surface, are a life support system for Earth to provide more than half of the oxygen we breathe. They are central to the planetary water cycle that produces rain and snow and nourish more than one billion people by providing their primary source of animal protein. The oceans also regulate global climate, med mediate temperatures and drive the weather, determining rainfall, droughts and flood. They are the world's largest store of carbon, an estimated 83% of the global carbon cycle is circulated through marine waters. Africa's plant and animal biodiversity in the water, on land and in the sky, is a great source of natural wealth. This is especially critical in my island country, Mauritius, by any standard, is tiny. But even though it is a neighbor islands are designated as biodiversity hotspots, almost 100 species have become extinct since the arrival of man in the 17th century, and only 2% of the native forests remain, clearly. 
combating climate change and biodiversity loss, including the invasion of non-native plant and animal species, is an urgent imperative. As an African leader who has spent much of her career in academic science, I feel an obligation to build a bridge between our environment and scientific research. The vital threats of biodiversity loss and climate change are themselves nested in the drive to advance human well-being and health. And the effectiveness of driving human health and well-being is leveraged by a continued investment in research and innovation. And this is why I agreed to serve as chair of the Coalition for African Research and Innovation, known as CARI, because this broad pan-African organization was created by private and public stakeholders in recognition that our health and well-being are at the nexus of not just the interdependent, transdisciplinary nature of scientific research, but a part of a broader context at the intersection of nutrition, health, agriculture, environment, governance, and the economy. These investments require sustained operational funding and capital support and the capacity to engage successfully with funders, government, policymakers, and communities. Ladies and gentlemen, only significant and simultaneous investment in the many elements of environmental preservation and scientific research, namely public-private investment in basic and applied research, building access to sustainable resources, creating the legal, regulatory, and policy conditions to encourage research and sustainable economies, policy development and education, training in research and innovation here on the continent will help create a robust research and innovation environment that leads to the deceleration of biodiversity loss, a slowing of rate of climate change, less disease, more prosperity, and more independence in Africa. I believe that the separation between the haves and the have-nots across the globe in the years to come will be defined by our investment in research and innovation to develop new opportunities for environmental protection and economic growth. As a scientist, I can regard research not as an expense, but as an investment in our common future. In Africa, we face barriers even higher than in as much as the rest of the world. Our continent is home to 15% of the global population, produces only 3% of its GDP, while carrying 25% of disease burden. Africa only accounts for just 2% of world research output, 1.3% of research spending, and 0.1% of patent. On a macroeconomic level, we are persistently dependent on short-term aid, undermining the obligations of our own government to create the right conditions to attract private investment and to fully exercise our political will in our interest. This, in turn, dilutes our ability to create robust infrastructure, set our own agenda, take control of our research activities, and fully profit from our own economy. Moreover, the effects of climate change are already acute in Africa. Observable effects on water resources, including flood, drought change in distribution of rainfall, drying up of rivers, melting of glaciers, and receding bodies of water. Drought, heat stress, and flooding have led to a reduction in crop yields and livestock productivity, and the destruction of homes, shelters, and villages across the continent vast landscape. Conflict over resources also exacerbate this impact and in turn contribute to ongoing migration within and between African uh, countries in Africa. The United Nations report predicts that access to water will be the single biggest cause of conflict and war in the next generation. Climate change and biodiversity loss and their impact on agriculture and therefore food security adds urgency to our fight against poverty and diseases in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, a recent study by Ezekiel Njeru and, and colleagues found that agrobiodiversity conservation is vital to attaining sustainable agricultural systems in the continent of limited external inputs and climate change. This is why the scholarly community assembled at the first International Agrobiodiversity Congress last year 
adopted the Delhi Declaration on Agrobiodiversity Management. The evidence is strong and growing that we must invest in and improve sustainable food systems to meet many of our SDGs. The broad element of healthy, diverse diet, seed and crop diversity, improvement in seed and crop delivery and cultivation, and the maintenance of our agrobiodiversity must be optimized to ensure a healthy and prosperous future for all our people. The magnitude of the task cannot be overstated. There is no scholarly consensus even on the number of plant species on Earth, much less on the best strategy to protect and benefit from them. Let me sketch one example. The Kew Royal Botanical Garden estimates that there are over 5,500 food plant species and almost 18,000 medicinal species, though some credible estimates that are over 75,000. Biodiversity scientists and myself know that solutions require knowledge, and knowledge starts with good data. This is why we need a universal agrobiodiversity index, another consensus imperative. This will, will be an important step towards developing the common understanding necessary to find global solutions to the human challenge of enduring health prosperity across the world. A major finding of the post-Paris Climate Accord UNFAO study is that hunger, poverty, biodiversity loss and climate change need to be tackled together. Farmers, pastoralists, fisher folk, community foresters depend on activities that are intimately and inextricably linked to the environment, and that these groups are also the most vulnerable to climate change. Securing the sustainable management, viability, and security of the world landscape will require far greater access to data, technologies, markets, information, and credit for investment to adjust the production systems and practices to our changing climate. We must bring all possible human financial resources to bear on creating a movement to protect our biodiversity and fight climate change and create a better Earth for people everywhere. The challenge is not easy. Reaching it depends on the contribution of highly skilled individuals from everywhere in the world, smart organizations and broad inclusive coalitions such as the DLF and ambitious initiatives such as CARI but it can be done because it must be done. Ladies and gentlemen, as I close, the GLF is an essential building block as we seek to build a sustainable future across the world's diverse landscape, a future that is bolstered by world-class training and scientific productivity here in Africa and elsewhere in the world. I'm confident that through commitment to scientific excellence, Increased investment in research and development and the power of partnership, the GLF can improve the everyday lives of citizens across the world. And our ability to create a sustainable future for ourselves is not optional. It is existential. Science needs to increasingly find solutions that are economically viable, socially relevant, environmentally benign, and for all these, political will and leadership is needed. We need to capitalize on the momentum gained in the global environment and conservation movement, but recognize that all actions are local. We need to emphasize the maintenance and sustainable use of our natural capital, recognize the important role of women and local communities. We need to mobilize cutting edge technology, recognize the value of indigenous knowledge, cultural traditions, forge partnership anchored in the common good for the benefit of all. We need to become the voice of change. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.